everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. We join you today from Pittsburgh County and the McAllister Union Stockyard for the OQBN Value Added Cattle Sale. We'll have more from here a little bit later in the show. But first, SUNUP's Curtis Hare catches up with our Extension Cropping System Specialist Josh Lofton for an update on winter crops. Well, it's been cold, warm, cold, and now warm again. So Josh, what's this weather, you know, how's that impacted the, you know, summer crops and then going into winter crops? Yeah, so it, it's been, it's just been a weird year all the way around. And, and, and this fall is continuing with that trend on into summer uh, or on into winter. Um, we're seeing that a lot of our, a lot of our summer crops, which are typically harvested much earlier in the year to allow enough adequate time to maybe get in a canola crop, get in a wheat crop, or maybe go into a cover crop system. Usually has adequate time. This year, because we have been so delayed, we're, we're very much delayed in getting a lot of our winter crops in, getting a lot of our winter time covers in. And, and so we see that uh, not only potentially is some of our yield being affected from our summer crop, but potentially some of our growth of our winter crops are, are being highly affected as well. What about the fluctuation in temperature for those winter crops that are actually in the ground? Is there any kind of impact for, for those crops? Yeah, I mean, there, it, it can be positive and negative depending on kind of what we see as the cumulative winter. Um, the good thing is, is uh, we haven't seen that sharp cold yet, and, and we haven't gone from that 90 degrees to that 15 degrees in a very short time that we all know Oklahoma can give to us. So that's pretty good. Uh, the, these, these subsequent warm days still give us this time for maybe some of our wheat crop, our canola crop, and some of those covers to continue to get a little bit grow to, to fully go into that uh, winter mode uh, before they kind of get hardened off and, and kind of go in. And, and when we talk more about our cover crop system, this is a real big thing because we, we are wanting a lot of growth to our covers. That's the point of having a cover crop out onto your system. Um, but the bad thing is, is when we look at our cover crops, some, some of the ones that have more of our fragile uh, broadleaf crops, like let's say uh, some of those uh, tillage radishes, um, some of those real uh, sensitive uh, pea species and all that, we're seeing them, even when we have those warm days, we're seeing them die off pretty, pretty rapidly. Well, it's, you know, time for winter crops and it's also time for the winter crops conference. Uh, kind of walk us through, that's coming up pretty quick. Uh, walk us through what uh, producers can expect this year at the conference. Yeah, so our winter crops conference is, is that which we have in Stillwater uh, every year and it's going to be on the 17th and 18th of December this year. The, the winter crop school has historically been the, the place to where we've gone and, and disseminated a lot of big research. Um, um, a lot of our CCAs come because we have a tremendous amount of credits to kind of maybe uh, fill in those gaps for our consultants that still need those CCA credits. This year we're offering 11 and a half of those CCA credits and three of the ODAF CEUs. Uh, so if, if growers, consultants, or industry are kind of looking for those last little credits to fill in the gap, we are gonna have quite a bit uh, available to them. And it's also gonna be a great conference. And in years past, it's been very focused on, on wheat. And, and don't worry, we're, we're still gonna have wheat there, but we're gonna talk a lot on uh, a lot of our cotton, some of the things we're learning about Oklahoma cotton production, especially as it gets out of Southwest Oklahoma and moves into the Panhandle and other regions. And then big time in our alfalfa. We've been getting a lot of questions in recent years on alfalfa and, and how to manage it, how to establish a good system. What are our different types of alfalfa that we can grow in the state? All right, thanks, Josh. Josh Lofton, Extension Cropping Systems Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. And if you would like a link to the Winter Crops Conference, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Thank you, gentlemen. The new year will bring some new rules when it comes to pesticide application in the state of Oklahoma. Here's our Extension Pesticide Safety Coordinator, Charles Looper, to explain. Yeah, as of October 1st, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry, or ODEF as we uh, say short, um, 
changed their testing procedure. They used to do that all themselves. They have contracted out with PSI test centers uh, for computer-based testing throughout the state uh, to hold those testing uh, locations at. Uh, they have uh, eight locations throughout the state. Um, it allows commercial applicators a lot more opportunity to test. Um, they are required to um, make an appointment. Uh, so we equate it that they need to go on and make like a hotel reservation. They can't walk in. It all has to be done either through the PSI uh, test center website or there is an 800 number uh, to call to make those reservations uh, for those testing. Coming up, there will be some changes after the first year. Our private applicators uh, who have never had to use this system will go to the using this system uh, and will now have to go to these test centers starting uh, in January of 2020. Uh, so they will need to get certified uh, this way to uh, make sure everybody is, is on the same page, kind of a new system for them. We have a link on our uh, pesticide education website, uh, very top link we have going on. We'll uh, give you the links to the PSI test centers. Um, we also have a little FAQ, if you frequently ask questions that will give some people an idea what they're walking into. Uh, that's a good place, uh, the instructions, the links for PSI. I, I would uh, encourage everybody to start off there at our, our website. Uh, at pesticide education at pestad.okstate.edu. Welcome to the weekly Mesonet Weather Report. I'm Wes Lee. Oklahomans experienced some of the most pleasant weather in the United States the first half of last week. Temperatures on Tuesday were near perfect and in the 70s across most of the state, reinforcing why fall is one of the most favorite times of year for many of us. Before this warming trend, we had experienced rather cool conditions in the state. This is one of the factors that has been limiting wheat production. We see just how cool we have been when we look at wheat degree days. Alva was only 73% of the five-year average as of the first of the week. Warica in the south was 78% of the five-year normal. The warmer weather this week should help turn this around. Projections for next week have us continuing to expect normal conditions for this time of year. For wheat, the issue I'm most concerned about is diminishing soil moisture. This map shows rain for the past seven days going back from Thursday morning. A narrow band from Jackson to Osage County received about a half an inch. The rest of the state, totals were much less. For the Panhandle and far southwest, it has been one to two months since a significant quarter inch rainfall has occurred. Gary is going to show you now some longer term rainfall statistics. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well, we continue to worry about drought expanding across western Oklahoma and especially in the Panhandle. So let's get straight to the new drought monitor map and see what we have. Well, we continue with the same pictures we've had for quite some time now. A drought centered across southwest Oklahoma and in the western Panhandle. But we have had a little bit more of expansion out in that Panhandle. We have severe and moderate drought expanding out in uh, uh, Cimarron and Texas counties. And a little bit more of the abnormally dry conditions, which isn't a drought category, but it is a precursor to drought. Uh, we also have had expansion of the abnormally dry conditions, again a drought precursor up into west central Oklahoma. So that's another area we're going to have to watch. A lot of this drought is centered over the last two to three months, uh, especially the last month as we started to dry out more and more. But if we look at the cool growing season, we see less than an inch in the central panhandle, but generally less than about five inches across the western third of Oklahoma. And of course, the eastern half of the state is in pretty good shape, and we have that transition zone across central Oklahoma from the dry west to the wet east. The departure from normal maps for this same time frame, September 1st through the current period, show deficits of two to three inches are common across western Oklahoma, but are as great as three to four inches in some areas. Now this dry weather and the cold weather also has started to impact our wheat conditions here in Oklahoma. If we look at the statistics from the National Agricultural Statistical Service from the USDA, we see 46% of the Oklahoma winter wheat crop is now considered in good to excellent shape, which is okay, um, but 
Uh, that's down from 11% from the last week. So we are starting to see that number start to go uh, backwards. We would like to see that reversed and those numbers start to go upwards. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Back to cattle now. It takes a lot of hard work and dedication to get calves ready for a value-added program like OQBN. But those are qualities that one producer here at the sale at McAllister has no shortage of. Sunup's Curtis Hare has her story. It's a crisp fall morning on the Miller family farm. Perfect conditions for the hardest working ranch hand on this production. For five-year-old Sadie Miller, Working cattle is her favorite thing to do, although some days are easier than others. Hey, 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 buddy. Buddy, buddy, stop. Can I just stop? You are so naughty. If you think a five-year-old has no business pushing cattle, don't tell Sadie that. All right, we got to be calm. We got to go to that corner and get those calves and bring them up here, OK? okay. And we'll give lock me, them give up. Me, give me. Yeah, she's getting uh, almost too comfortable with the cows. Sometimes she wants to take off and and go get a cow by herself. And we like, to, we like to give her some independence, but also be right there in case something goes wrong to help her out. That one's chewing up the wire. Baby. Come here, baby. You've got to be kidding me. She was out here when she was about a month old. It was the first time she probably saw a cow. For Sadie's mom, Lindsay, seeing her daughter take to the farm life at such a young age is a little more than surprising. I was shocked to see that this was something that she was really interested in and she's actually very knowledgeable about it for a five-year-old. She knows way more than I do. I put your tags out with this one and I put pills in cow's mouth with this. I've seen people do this but I've never done it before. Um, if, if a cow got bit by a raccoon or something, I really want to put this on a towel and just scrub it. It may seem Sadie is just helping out on the farm the way children like to do, but for her, it's an actual job. No, seriously, Sadie owns some of these calves. Uh, this will be her fourth year to sell calves. Uh, you know, slowly we've built her up to five head. Sadie's calves are part of the Oklahoma Quality Beef Network, and she takes part in both buying and selling cattle. What does she do with all that money? The answer is the reason her parents had her put on the ranching hat at such a young age. We started Sadie a savings account when she was born, and we realized we weren't making much interest off of that savings account, so we decided to invest in cows for her instead. As she gets older, um, we hope to be able to use that for a college fund for her and uh, to support whatever she wants her future to be. The, uh, the Miller family is, is just a really a tremendous family. This is the next generation. Uh, they grow them young, start them young, and I just think it's tremendous that we have uh, someone at this age that is interested in, in uh, the OQBM program, preconditioning program, and, and doing the right things in the cattle business. Following close behind her dad, Sadie is learning lessons on the ranch Wade learned from his father, a Miller family tradition. In some of our pastures, she's the fourth generation of our family to, to wean a calf off of that land, so that's pretty neat. For Lindsay, the work ethic Sadie is developing and the lessons learned are invaluable, but most importantly, she's grown so much as a person. She has always been very shy, and we've tried to do dance with her, and those things just made her really nervous and she wasn't interested, but 4-H, showing cattle, all of those things have made her really come out of her shell. Sadie will continue to buy and sell cattle, Let's go. saving every bit she makes for her future. Well, maybe not all. Well, sometimes when I lose a tooth, I don't save it. And who knows? Maybe she'll continue with the Miller tradition and take over the reins of the cattle production. Although she thinks she's ready now. I can open that door so I can close it. Dad, can you go get a cow? Pittsburgh County, I'm Curtis Hare. We're joined now by Brian Frecking, who is our area livestock specialist. Brian, great to see stories like Sadie's, really the next generation of Oklahoma cattle producers. 
yeah, we're excited to have somebody uh, of this kind of age and, and uh, you know, having that excitement for, for being in the cattle business that she wants to come and see her own cattle being sold today. So uh, we're excited to see what happens today. It's going to be a great sale. Lots of cattle are being uh, brought in today, so we expect uh, good things to happen. Um, in general, how are things going in southeastern Oklahoma in terms of, of the cattle industry? Give us an overview. So I think, uh, you know, producers are always uh, struggling a little bit with, with the tightness of, of just their uh, uh, operating expenses. But, you know, hay production's been good this year, so people are feeling good about, you know, the hay stocks, uh, feeding their cattle through the winter. It's nice to see great weather today. Uh, last week we got a taste of winter, and so uh, we, we always feel better when the sun's out. And, and so producers are enrolling cattle in these sales at a pretty good pace, and, and we're getting towards the end of those uh, where they have time to enroll them. So my job is busy of, of making sure they're, they're enrolled in these sales and get the most they can out of them. And you and the other area livestock specialists in Oklahoma and, and your extension colleagues in the county offices, you're really boots on the ground to make sure that OQBM program goes like it should. Give us some perspective on that. Yeah, so so it's probably one of my funner things to do in my job is to actually go out and visit with the producers. Now, a lot of the uh, uh, people enrolling these cattle from, are from all parts of the state, and I can't make it to everyone. And, and we do need area livestock specialists in each part of the state, but we also need those local county educators to go out and do the same thing. And I've spent hours where it should have only probably taken 10 or 15 minutes because we just have good conversations. Maybe it's on the, the herd health vaccination, clearing up some, some uh, misinformation, what have you. And so that's, that's the beautiful thing about working with this program is to get out there and visit with the producers themselves. And for someone who maybe has is, is heard a little bit about it, may want to try it for the first time, what would you tell them? Once they get started, you know, is it, is it easier to keep up with it than they might think? Yeah, probably the, the one scary part is what do I do with my calves when I've weaned the calves? I've got to put them in a place to, to hold them for 45 days. That's our minimum standard to be weaned from the cow for 45 days. And they may not all have those uh, facilities to do that. So once they fi figure a way to do that, then, then they get to, uh, to see the benefits of, of raising a, a healthier calf that goes on into the industry and that's what the buyers are looking for and the premiums have been there so uh, we expect them to have those good successes and uh, we, we just uh, hope this continues for many years. Okay great well nice to see you Brian and for more information about the OQBM program just go to our website sunup.okstate.edu. With the prospects of good wheat pasture for many places in Oklahoma this fall and winter, some cow-calf operators are going to want to use that wheat pasture as a supplement for even the mature cows as they go th into the, the winter months. One of the ways to utilize that more efficiently is by what I call limit grazing of that wheat pasture. And by that, uh, I mean actually letting the cows graze on the wheat pasture for one day and then perhaps off on dry pasture, Bermuda or native pasture, for one to two days and then let them back onto the wheat pasture again for their intake of that uh, wheat pasture as, as a supplement. You know a wheat pasture when it's rapidly growing will be something in the neighborhood of 25 maybe as high as 30 percent crude protein on a dry matter basis. And so when cows get a, a full feed of wheat pasture, it supplies a lot of the protein needs that they're going to need. Dry cows, those that haven't calved yet, those that are going to calve next spring, can get what they need in terms of protein by being on wheat pasture for three to five hours and then back on dry pasture and perhaps uh, availability of some dry hay for a couple of days. So one day on wheat pasture, off on dry pasture two days. As those cows calve, if we're still going to utilize wheat pasture as a source of supplement, uh, supplemental protein, then we probably need to let those cows have access to the wheat pasture uh, a higher percentage of the time. 
uh, at a minimum once every other day. One day on wheat pasture, one day back off on dry pasture. I like the idea of being out there to move those cows back off of the wheat pasture after three to five hours. You can observe them when they start to uh, quit uh, grazing, laying down, then that's the time to go ahead and move them off the wheat pasture and uh, I think we'll make better use of it. Also, you might consider strip grazing the wheat pasture to get even a little bit more efficient, especially if you have a limited amount of wheat pasture. It'll take uh, some place in the neighborhood of about one acre per cow if we're really efficient with the use of that wheat pasture as a way of providing protein supplement for a large part of their winter needs. I thought this would help in terms of uh, giving the folks that can use wheat pasture an idea about how to save some uh, protein dollars in terms of supplement by utilizing that resource that's available. We look forward to visiting with you again next week on SunUp's Cow-Calf Corner. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist, joins us now. Kim, wheat, corn, soybean, cotton prices all relatively low. We want to kind of analyze why. Let's start with corn. Well, if looking at corn, uh, the five-year average price for corn in the United States is $3.53. The, the national average price for the next marking year is three eighty-five, so slightly above average. If you look at uh, world corn uh, production, it's projected to be 43.4 billion bushels. Uh, the record is 4.4 billion. The average is 4.26, so slightly above average production. If you look at world ending stocks for corn, 11.6 billion bushels, 13.9 is the record, 12.6 is the average, so slightly b below average ending stocks. Now, corn uh, production for the U.S., 13.7 billion bushels, 15.1 record, 14.4 uh, average, so slightly uh, above uh, average or below average production there in the United States. Soybeans is a little different than corn. Uh, you know, uh, Brazil has taken over the soybean market. If you look at average U.S. prices for the last five years, $9.27 a bushel. It's projected to be nine, right? Uh, slightly below average. Uh, the world uh, soybean production is 12.4 billion bushels. The average 12.4, so the world right at average. The United States soybean production, 1.8 billion bushels, average 2.2. So you've got Brazil with their, with their record uh, soybean crop controlling those prices. Let's talk wheat now and why those prices are below average. Oh, wheat's, uh, oh, wheat's just in the tank. Uh, you got the uh, average uh, U.S. price for wheat now the last five years, $4.93 a bushel. Our price is projected to be right at average on uh, $5 for the U.S. But since July 1 in, in Oklahoma, our wheat price on a daily price average is $3.91. Uh, you look at uh, world production for wheat, 28.2 billion bushels, a record. Ending stocks for the world, 10.6 billion bushels, a record. Stocks to use ratio, 38.2%, a record. So you've got uh, record world uh, production, record world stocks in Oklahoma. We not only have high stocks, but we've got relatively low protein and quality. And I think that's impacting our prices, and that's why our prices are relatively low. So a lot of numbers, what are the takeaways for producers? What we've got to remember is that prices move in cycles. Uh, you know, we, we've had relatively good pot, cotton prices, so people started producing cotton. Cotton prices went up to record levels, cotton prices go down. Just prices, wheat, corn, beans, cotton are going to go in cycles. Uh, what you've got to do is concentrate on the average and keep your costs low and your quality high. That is key. Kim, thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. Purchasing a bull uh, for beef producers is usually a substantial investment. And most of the time we make sure those bulls pass a bovine breeding soundness exam. But we don't usually test these bulls for diseases that could possibly be spread by those bulls in the herd. Diseases like persistently infected bovine diarrhea or trichrichomonas or uh, bovine leukemia virus. There's been a recent study that was conducted up in Michigan looking at the potential transmission of bovine leukemia viruses by bulls. We know that bovine leukemia virus typically doesn't cause any clinical signs in cattle. 
a percentage, around 30% of those that are infected will have what we call a persistent lymphocytosis. That means they have an elevated lymphocyte count. Uh, and less than 5% are actually going to come down with the cancer, which we refer to as a malignant lymphoma or a lymphosarcoma in those cattle. We know that the way this disease is transferred is through blood. So anything that transfers blood from one animal to the other is, it could possibly transfer this virus. So not changing needles or not changing palpation sleeves. Uh, inset vectors have been uh, proposed as a possible way to transfer blood as disease. But not very many people have, have thought about a bull breeding a cow as a way to transfer this disease. There's been one study that showed that there was an association between bovine leukemia virus transmission during the breeding process and this was thought to be occur because of trauma that may occur during the breeding process. In the other study that was conducted in Michigan, they found that these bulls in, in these particular herds had, ele had this persistent lymph lymphocytosis, which means they had elevated lymphocytes circulating. So the authors of this study felt like that bulls could be a source of transmission of bovine leukemia virus during the breeding season. So they advised that testing bulls for bovine leukemia virus before turning them out with the cows would be a good management practice to begin. Hey, if you'd like some more information about bovine leukemia virus in bulls, if you'll go to sunup.okstate.edu. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime on our website, sunup.okstate.edu, and also follow us on YouTube and social media. From Pittsburgh County, I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.